These prolegomena are not for the use of pupils, but of future teachers. And even the latter should not expect that they will be made serviceable for the systematic exposition of a ready-made science, but merely for the discovery of the science itself. There are scholars for whom the history of philosophy, both ancient and modern, is philosophy itself. For these, the present prolegomena are not written. They must wait until those who endeavor to draw from the fountain of reason itself have completed their work. It will then be the turn of such scholars to inform the world of what has been done. Unfortunately, nothing can be said which, in their opinion, has not been said before. And truly, the same prophecy applies to all future time. For since the human reason has, for many centuries, speculated upon innumerable objects in various ways, it is hardly to be expected that we should not be able to discover analogies for every new idea among the old sayings of past ages. My object is to persuade all those who think metaphysics worth studying that it is absolutely necessary to pause a moment and disregarding all that has been done to propose first the preliminary question whether such a thing as metaphysics is at all possible. If it is a science, how does it happen that it cannot, like other sciences, obtain universal and permanent recognition? If not, how can it maintain its pretensions and keep the human understanding in suspense, with hopes never ceasing, yet never fulfilled? Whether then we demonstrate our knowledge or our ignorance in this field, we must come once and for all to a definite conclusion respecting the nature of this so-called science, which cannot possibly remain on its present footing. It seems almost ridiculous, while every other science is continually advancing, that in this, which pretends to be wisdom incarnate, for whose oracle everyone inquires, we should constantly move around the same spot without gaining a single step. And so, its supporters having melted away, we do not find that people who are confident of their ability to shine in other sciences venture their reputation here, where everybody, however ignorant in other matters, presumes to deliver a final verdict, inasmuch as in this domain there is as yet no standard weight and measure to distinguish soundness from shallow talk. After all, it is nothing extraordinary in the elaboration of a science, when people begin to wonder how far it is advanced, that the question should at last occur as to whether and how, in general, such a science is possible. Human reason so delights in constructions that it is several times built up a tower and then raised it to examine the nature of the foundation. It is never too late to become reasonable and wise, but if the insight comes late, there is always more difficulty in starting the change. The question whether a science be possible presupposes a doubt as to its actuality. But such a doubt offends the person whose entire goods may perhaps consist in this supposed jewel. Hence, they who raise the doubt must expect opposition from all sides. Some, in the proud consciousness of their possessions, which are ancient and therefore considered legitimate, will take their metaphysical compendia in their hands and look down on them with contempt. Others who never see anything except it be identical with what they have somewhere else seen before will not understand them, and everything will remain for a time as if nothing can happen to excite the concern or the hope for an impending change. Nevertheless, I venture to predict that the independent reader of these prolegomena will not only doubt their previous science, but ultimately be fully persuaded that it cannot exist unless the demands here stated on which its possibility depends be satisfied. And, as this has never been done, that there is, as yet, no such thing as metaphysics. But as it can never cease to be in demand, since the interests of human reason in general are intimately interwoven with it, 
they must confess that a radical reform, or rather a rebirth, of the science according to a new plan is unavoidable, however much people may struggle against it for a while. Since the essays of Locke and Leibniz, or rather since the origin of metaphysics so far as we know its history, nothing has ever happened which could have been more decisive to its fate than the attack made upon it by David Hume. He threw no light on this kind of knowledge, but he certainly struck a spark from which light might have been obtained. Had it caught some inflammable substance and had its smoldering fire been carefully nursed and developed. Hume started mainly from a single but important concept in metaphysics, namely that of the connection of cause and effect, including its derivative concepts of force and action, etc. He challenged reason, which pretends to have given birth to this concept of herself, to answer him by what right she thinks anything could be so constituted that if that thing be posited, something else also must necessarily be posited. For this is the meaning of the concept of cause. He demonstrated irrefutably that it was entirely impossible for reason to think a priori and by means of concepts, such a combination as involves necessity. We cannot at all see why, in consequence of the existence of one thing, another must necessarily exist, or how the concept of such a combination can arise a priori. Hence, he inferred that reason was altogether deluded with reference to this concept, while she erroneously considered as one of her children whereas in reality it was nothing but a bastard of imagination, impregnated by experience, which subsumed certain representations under the law of association, and mistook a subjective necessity, custom, for an objective necessity arising from insight. Hence he inferred that reason had no power to think such connections, even in general, because her concepts would then be purely fictitious, and all her pretended a priori cognitions, nothing but common experiences marked with a false stamp. This is as much as to say that there is not and cannot be any such thing as metaphysics at all. However hasty and mistaken Hume's conclusion may appear, it was at least founded upon investigation. And this investigation deserved the concentrated attention of the brighter spirits of his day, as well as determined efforts on their part to discover, if possible, a happier solution of the problem in the sense proposed by him, all of which would have speedily resulted in a complete reform of the sciences. But Hume suffered the usual misfortune of metaphysicians, of not being understood. It is positively painful to see how utterly his opponents, Reed, Oswald, Beattie, and at lastly, Priestley, missed the point of the problem. For while they were ever taking for granted that which he doubted, and demonstrating with zeal and often with impudence that which he never thought of doubting, they so misconstrued his valuable suggestion that everything remained in its old condition as if nothing has happened. The question was not whether the concept of cause was right, useful, and even indispensable for our knowledge of nature, for this Hume had never doubted, but rather whether that concept could be thought by reason a priori, and consequently whether it possessed an inner truth, independent of all experience, implying a more widely extended usefulness, not limited merely to objects of experience. This was Hume's problem. It was a question concerning the origin of the concept, not concerning its indispensability in use. Were the former decided, the conditions of its use and the sphere of its valid application would have been determined as a matter of course. But to satisfy the conditions of the problem, the opponents of the great thinker should have penetrated very deeply into the nature of reason. So far, it is concerned with pure thought, a task which did not suit them. They found a more convenient method of being defiant without any insight, vis-a-vis -vis the appeal to common sense. It is indeed a great gift of heaven to possess right, or 
as they now call it, plain common sense. But this common sense must be shown in deeds by well-considered and reasonable thoughts and words. Not by appealing to it as an oracle when no rational justification of oneself can be advanced. To appeal to common sense when insight and science fail, and no sooner, this is one of the most subtle discoveries of modern times, by means of which the most superficial ranter can safely enter the lists with the most thorough thinker and hold his own. But as long as a particle of insight remains, no one would think of having recourse to this subterfuge. Seen in a clear light, it is but an appeal to the opinion of the multitude, of whose applause the philosopher is ashamed, while the popular charlatan glories and confides in it. I should think that Hume might fairly have laid as much claim to common sense as Beatty, and in addition, to a critical reason such as the latter did not possess, which keeps common sense in check and prevents it from speculating, or if speculations are under discussion, restrains the desire to decide because it cannot satisfy itself concerning its own principles. By this means alone can common sense remain sound. Chisels and hammers may suffice to work a piece of wood, but for etching we require an etcher's needle. Thus, common sense and speculative understanding are both useful, but each in its own way. The former in judgments, which apply immediately to experience. The latter when we judge universally from mere concepts, as in metaphysics, where sound common sense so-called in spite of the inappropriateness of the word, has no right to judge at all. I openly confess that my remembering David Hume was the very thing which many years ago first interrupted my dogmatic slumber and gave my investigations in the field of speculative philosophy a quite new direction. I was far from following him in the conclusions to which he arrived by considering not the whole of his problem, but a part which by itself can give us no information. If we start from a well-founded but undeveloped thought, which another has bequeathed to us, we may well hope by continued reflection to advance further than the acute person to whom we owe the first spark of light. So I tried first whether Hume's objection could not be put into a general form, and soon found that the concept of the connection of cause and effect was by no means the only concept by which the understanding thinks the connection of things a priori, but rather that metaphysics consists altogether of such concepts. I sought to ascertain their number, and when I had satisfactorily succeeded in this by starting from a single principle, I proceeded to the deduction of these concepts, which I was now certain were not derived from experience, as Hume had tried, but straying from the pure understanding. This deduction, which seemed impossible to my acute predecessor and had never even occurred to anyone else, though no one had hesitated to use the concepts without investigating the basis of their objective validity, was the most difficult task ever undertaken in the service of metaphysics. And the worst was that metaphysics such as it then existed, could not assist me in the least, because this deduction alone can render metaphysics possible. But as soon as I had succeeded in solving Hume's problem, not merely in a particular case, but with respect to the whole faculty of pure reason, I could perceive safely, though slowly, to determine the whole sphere of pure reason completely and from universal principles, in its boundaries, as well as in its contents. This was required for metaphysics in order to construct its system according to a sure plan. But I fear that the working out of Hume's problem in its widest extent, namely my critique of pure reason, will fare as the problem itself fared when first proposed it will be misjudged because it is misunderstood, and misunderstood because people choose to skim through the book and not to think through it, 
a disagreeable task, because the work is dry, obscure, opposed to all ordinary notions, and moreover long-winded. Now, I confess that I did not expect to hear from philosophers complaints of want of popularity, entertainment, and facility when the existence of a highly prized and indispensable cognition is at stake, which cannot be established otherwise than by the strictest rules of scholarly precision. Popularity may follow, but is inadmissible at the beginning. Yet as regards a certain obscurity, arising particularly from the diffuseness of the plan, owing to which the principal points of the investigation are easily lost sight of, the complaint is just, and I intend to remove it by the present prolegomena. The first mentioned work, which discusses the pure faculty of reason in its whole extent and bounds, will remain the foundation to which the prolegomena, as a preliminary exercise, refer. For that critique must exist as a science, systematic and complete as to its smallest parts, before we can think of letting metaphysics appear on the scene, or even have the most distant hope of so doing. We have been long accustomed to seeing antiquated knowledge produced as new by taking it out of its former context and fitting it into a systematic dress of any fancy pattern under new titles. Most readers will set out by expecting nothing else from the critique. But these prolegomena may persuade them that it is a perfectly new science, of which no one has ever even thought, the very idea of which was unknown, and for which nothing hitherto accomplished can be of the smallest use except it be the suggestion of Hume's doubt. Yet even he did not suspect such a formal science, but ran his ship ashore, for safety's sake landing on skepticism, there to let it lie and rot. Whereas my object is rather to give it a pilot, who, by means of safe navigational principles drawn from a knowledge of the globe and provided with a complete chart and compass, may steer the ship safely, whither he listeth. If in a new science that is wholly isolated and unique in its kind, we started with the prejudice that we can judge of things by means of would-be knowledge previously acquired, even though this is precisely what has first to be called in question, then we should only fancy we saw everywhere what we had already known, because the expressions have a similar sound. Yet everything would appear utterly metamorphosed, senseless, and unintelligible, because we should have as a foundation our own thoughts, made by long habit as a second nature instead of the author's. However, the long-windedness of the work, so far as it depends on the science itself and not on the exposition, its consequent unavoidable dryness, and its scholastic precision are qualities which can only benefit the science, though they may discredit the book. Few writers are gifted with the subtlety and at the same time with the grace of David Hume, or with the depth as well as the elegance of Moses Mendelssohn. Yet I flatter myself that I might have made my own exposition popular if my object had been merely to sketch out a plan and leave its completion to others, instead of having my heart in the welfare of the science to which I had devoted myself so long. In truth, it required no little constancy and even self-denial to postpone the sweets of an immediate success to the prospect of a slower but more lasting reputation. Making plans is often the occupation of an opulent and boastful mind, which thus obtains the reputation of a creative genius by demanding what it cannot itself supply, by censuring what it cannot approve, and by proposing what it knows not where to find. And yet something more should belong to a sound plan of a general critique of pure reason than mere conjectures, if this plan is to be other than the usual declamations of pious aspirations. 
but pure reason is a sphere so separate and self-contained that we cannot touch a part without affecting all the rest. We can therefore do nothing without first determining the position of each part and its relation to the rest. For inasmuch as our judgment cannot be corrected by anything outside of pure reason, so the validity and use of every part depends upon the relation in which it stands to all the rest within the domain of reason. Just as in the structure of an organized body, the end of each member can only be deduced from the full conception of the whole. It may, then, be said of such a critique that it is never trustworthy except it be perfectly complete, down to the smallest elements of pure reason. In the sphere of this faculty, you can determine everything or not. But although a mere sketch preceding the critique of pure reason would be unintelligible, unreliable, and useless, it is all the more useful as a sequel, which enables us to grasp the whole, to examine in detail the chief points of importance in the science, and to improve in many respects our exposition, as compared with the first execution of the work. That work being completed, I offer here such a plan which is sketched out after an analytical method, while the critique itself had to be executed in the synthetical style, in order that the science may present all its articulations as the structure of a peculiar cognitive faculty in their natural combination. But should any reader find this plan, which I publish as the prolegomena to any future metaphysics, still obscure, let him consider that not everyone is bound to study metaphysics that many minds will succeed very well in the exact and even in deep sciences more closely allied to intuition, while they cannot succeed in investigations dealing exclusively with abstract concepts. In such cases, people should apply their talents to other subjects. But they who undertake to judge, or still more, to construct a system of metaphysics must satisfy the demands here made either by adopting my solution or by thoroughly refuting it and substituting another. To evade it is impossible. In conclusion, let it be remembered that this much-abused obscurity, frequently serving as a mere pretext under which people hide their own indolence or dullness, has its uses, since all who in other sciences observe a judicious silence speak authoritatively in metaphysics and make bold decisions because their ignorance is not here contrasted with the knowledge of others. Yet it does contrast with sound critical principles, which we may therefore commend in the words of Virgil, they keep out of the hives the drones, an indolent bunch.